Hi, my name is Christina Keeling from Lancaster Farms in Suffolk, Virginia, and you're listening to Upstart Farmers Radio. Welcome back to Upstart Farmers Radio, the podcast for farmers looking to make an impact and a living. I'm Perry Baptista here in Laramie, Wyoming on a pretty rainy day, and I'm joined by Dr. Nate Story. How are you today, Nate? I'm doing great, Perry. Thanks. And we've got Amy Story here today with us, too. How are you, Amy? Awesome. Thanks, Perry. So, Amy, um, we've brought you here for a pretty specific reason today. Here in Wyoming, we're finally maybe kind of thinking about summer at this point, which means that there's a lot more going on outside. There's flies, mosquitoes that even the non-gardeners and non-farmers have noticed. And so, you know, just about everybody is thinking about pest control at this time of the year. But this really isn't just a seasonal problem for upstart farmers, now is it, Nate? No, it's not. So no matter where you're growing, you're gonna have pest issues. And the people who think that they can avoid pest issues by exclusion alone are um, maybe not being realistic about uh, how how nature works. So no matter where you're growing, whether it's a greenhouse, warehouse, indoors, outdoors, you will have pests. And uh, dealing with those pests needs to be something that you understand and are prepared to do. So that's why we've got Amy here with us today. Amy, you're kind of our office uh, pest control expert. You've written several things for the... Uh, vertical food blog. Um, So we're happy to have you joining us here today. Thanks, Perry. Yeah, like Nate was saying, a lot of people underestimate how well adapted a lot of insects and diseases are to get into your system. So you cannot rely on exclusion alone. Hi, this is Chris from Rochester, Minnesota with Fresh With Edge. And the most common pest that we deal with is definitely has to be aphids. We uh, get a little bit of help from our white fly friends, which we get as much as we can and we appreciate. And then we have some pesticides that are organic certified that we have to use every once in a while when they get really intense. The worst pest outbreak that we had to deal with probably again was with aphids. I would say that the difficult part of it was that we tried to solve it with ladybugs before we really had a filtration system set up. And so it wasn't the pests that were the problem, it was more of the clogging of our system before we had our filtration set up that caused all the problems. So Amy, we want to pick your brain on integrated pest management, or IPM. What is integrated pest management? This sounds kind of fancy and complicated. Sure, so it's actually a lot more intuitive than you would think. Integrated pest management is using multiple types of pest controls uh, combined together in such a way that it works to your economic benefit, as well as having a more sustainable long-term effect on pest management in your system. You bet. So, I mean, the thing with integrated pest management is you're thinking about it through the lenses of economics, right? We don't care about removing all of the pests necessarily, we care about removing the most economically uh, advantageous number of pests. And um, so that's the biggie, is making sure that, you know, for all of our upstart farmers, is making sure that the economics are being considered of all of our pest management. Right, and there's a very specific point at which you want to start using an integrated pest management, which is called the action threshold. So the action threshold is when the benefit of implementing pest control management is greater than the cost of not implementing pest control management, right? <laughs> yes, the the loss that you would get if bought from pests. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tracking. <laughs> so is IPM something that's all that new, or are most gardeners and farmers already familiar with it? No, it's not really a new idea. Yeah, I mean, so... Um, a lot of farmers are already doing pest management, right? But the question is w- of whether they're actually doing any kind of economic analysis. The question of, you know, do they understand exactly how they're controlling pest populations and do they have a strategy for maintaining kind of those thresholds? That's kind of the big question. And I don't think that most farmers are doing that. So we're talking a lot about this action threshold and the point at which it's economic to um, implement these pest controls. So if farmers are looking to implement an IPM strategy, what do they need to do to define these points and kind of get this IPM system going? 
So, you know, a lot of that depends on uh, pest counts. So it requires that you're paying close attention to the pest populations in your system, in your greenhouse, in your warehouse, in your garden, that you're tracking those. And um, you'll see a lot of greenhouses have yellow and blue sticky traps. Those are not to actually remove pests. Those are to count the number of pests in the greenhouse and help determine when they're, they're hitting one of those action thresholds. So um, for most farmers, you know, it's about keeping track of the pests, how many do you have, and um, actually defining how much economic damage those pests are doing. So it takes some experience and you have to understand, you know, when does my crop become unsaleable? How much does it cost me to rinse this in extra time to get rid of these insects or what have you? And um, it really just keeps, uh, it really comes, boils down to tracking the pests in your system and knowing the effect that they have. And then using that information to determine when it is most cost effective to spray. Right. So to do that, you're going to want to be able to compare it with the cost of funding an uh, integrated pest management strategy. I would say that it would be a good idea to have an IPM strategy ready to go. So you should be planning an IPM strategy before you even hit the action threshold. Oh, yeah. I mean, so this is a common thing, right? If, if you start your system and you're growing and then you start to notice pests and then you decide what you're going to do, you've already failed. So for any grower, before you even get started growing, before you plant seeds, before you build a greenhouse, you should have at least kind of the outline of an integrated pest management system. You know, am I using beneficials? What kind of beneficials am I using? What pests do I expect to see? How will I control them? What um, pesticides can I use? What pesticides are, can I not use? What do my customers want? All of these things factor into that. And along with that is, you know, how much am I willing to lose or how much can I afford to lose to insects? Right. or disease, or fungus, or what have you. So when it comes to planning an IPM strategy, I would say it could be broken down into two really broad steps. You survey the pests you have, and the controls that you have at your disposal, and then you figure out how you can com combine them in a way that works. Well, and keeping in mind the economics, because it isn't free. It isn't, well, it's not free and it's not cheap to spray. Yeah. It's not free, it's not cheap to introduce beneficials. There is an economic cost to spraying on a regular basis. So it's trying to find the, the, the fine line between constantly spraying and just making sure you're always just keeping them at, at the lowest level possible and you know controlling pests at the most advantageous uh, kind of population level. So Amy, we were chatting before this and you talked about kind of the four big rules of an IPM strategy um, that I think would be really applicable to folks who are planning their IPM strategy on the front end. Can you tell us a little more about what those four rules are and how they can go for it? All right, so the first rule is only spraying when you need to. So we're talking about pesticides here. And the reason that we say that is that a lot of pests will adapt to resist a specific pesticide. Right, so I mean, Insects reproduce very quickly and they build up resistance. Um, so it's not just about saving money on pesticides, it's about slowing down the development of that resistance. And as part of that too, we're switching between insecticides. So if we're using like uh, neem oil one week, then we use something else the next. And uh, of course using biologicals as much as we can as well. Right, so then the second rule would be to know your system. You're gonna know, wanna know what crops you have, which pests work well with other pests, if you're using beneficial insects, they're going to be affected by the pesticides that you're using. You just really want to know in detail your pests and your crops. So then the third rule is to use natural predators whenever you can, uh, which is something that Nate already mentioned, partly because of resistance to pesticides, but also because if you have a natural predator already in your greenhouse or warehouse and it takes care of the pest, a lot of the times it will maintain kind of a pilot population. Um, and when the pest flares up again, the predator will flare up in response to it and it just kind of takes care of the problem for you sometimes. You bet. So I mean the one thing that I would add to that is a lot of people look at using beneficials as their primary pest control. And that's just not a realistic thing either. They're great for background control, but when it comes down to it, you have to have a variety of controls for your insect population. So don't right out of the gate think you're going to be able to control everything with beneficial insects. 
And I think one great tip that was shared with us on beneficial insects, actually by Chris Lukenbell, uh, Upstart Farm with Fresh with Edge, was to find out what the natural predator is that's in your area. So in his case, I believe he had an aphid problem and he found out that he had a natural population of lacewings in the field outside his greenhouse. So encouraging that lacewing population rather than introducing another kind of biological control for aphids turned out to be the most effective method for his particular greenhouse. Great. And the fourth rule is something we've already talked about, which is only doing it when it's economically beneficial. To know that, though, you have to know what it costs you to spray. Right. So what is the hourly rate that you're paying someone to spray? What is your hourly rate? What is your time worth? Uh, what is the cost of the materials? So whether you're spraying an insecticide or something like that, how does that spraying affect your crops? Because oftentimes it will slow growth with some of these um, sprays. So knowing kind of what kind of effect it can have on your crop and the economic damage the spraying can cause. And then of course it takes understanding what kind of damage the insects are actually doing to your crop, or the fungus or the blight or whatever your thing is. So I think maybe the hardest rule for farmers who are just getting started or who are still planning their farms is figuring out what kind of pests you're actually gonna face. And it's always dependent on your greenhouse, your area, you know, where you're geographically located. So I think the best way to get a sense of what pests most upstart farmers are facing is actually by hearing from those upstart farmers themselves. I'm Hank Warmer with Lancaster Farms. Our most common pests are uh, on the insect side, aphids. We've dealt with a few thrips, but aphids have been the worst. On the fungus side, botrytis has been our biggest pest. We're just super humid here in southeastern Virginia, and when the greenhouse is shut up because it's cold, we're just not getting enough airflow and just kind of chase it around. But that's been our, our biggest pest. Our worst pest outbreak so far has definitely been botrytis. Early on, before we really started making treatments, we did have some pretty bad aphid outbreaks. And they seem to like certain things. Uh, we have problems with it in Swiss chard, some pop choy, or probably our two worst, occasionally collards. But by far, botrytis has been our biggest problem. All right, so we're continuing our discussion here of IPM, or Integrated Pest Management. So Amy, what kinds of control types might farmers be looking at um, when they're using IPM? There are four main control types, chemical, mechanical, cultural, and biological. Chemical controls are pretty obvious. Those are gonna be your pesticides. Mechanical controls, on the other hand, are gonna be practices like picking insects off of leaves by hand or removing foliage that is infected with, say, powdery mildew. Cultural controls are a little bit trickier to define because cultural controls are when you basically interrupt a insect's life cycle, and they overlap a lot with the other control groups. Um, for cultural controls, you're gonna take an insect, know its life cycle intimately, and then say you have an insect that lays eggs in the soil. A way of controlling that insect culturally would be to remove the top soil where you know those eggs are. And then biological controls are primarily the use of natural predators against insect pests. So like some examples in a greenhouse would be, you know, spraying, spraying your crop with neem or a soap or something like that for, uh, as a chemical control. Uh, mechanical would be like washing the produce, rinsing insects off, um, physically removing produce. Cultural could be anything from washing your implements to, it, it's mostly human behavior, right? We, we, we change our behavior we, or we behave in a way um, that, that interrupts the pest cycle or um, interrupts the spread of a pest or an organism. So that could be something as simple as washing your scissors after you harvest product. And biological, of course, is something like my control, uh, using fungal spores, using bacterial things like serenade, or using beneficial insects like green lacewing or aphidus wasps, something along those lines. And there's a lot of information out there on which kind of controls will be best to your specific pest problem. We've also written on those controls several times if you check out Brad Agritech's blog or our ebook resources. So I think throughout our conversation here, we've talked quite a bit about chemical and biological controls. Those are the two really big ones we hear 
farmers talking about and having questions on. So are mechanical and cultural just sort of overlooked or are they not quite as effective, more expensive? What's the deal? So cultural and biological are more like about habit, right? So cultural controls are about um, developing good working habits, understanding the insects, understanding or your uh, fungal pathogen or what have you and understanding how you um, reduce the spread of that organism or impact the life cycle of that organism. And it typically is through human behavior or some type of habit, whether it's a foot bath before you wash into, walk into the greenhouse, whether it is, um, you know, removing... Well, it, it typically centers around human behavior and interrupting life cycles. So, you know, that's, that's more of a habitual thing. That's training your people to do things right. You know, it's using a bleach solution to rinse your cutting knives when you're done harvesting. Biological is more of background for the most part. We have um, events like if you were to bring 10,000 ladybugs into your greenhouse and release them all at once, yes, you'd see kind of a, a fairly immediate effect over the following days, but then it kind of fades down into just background control. And so um, we tend to like to wait until pest populations get really big and they're causing a lot of problems and then we go through and we spray and we kill them all. And we like that because it's a little bit easier and it's more responsive, right? We're reacting to, um, to the pests building up in our greenhouse. Whereas cultural and biological um, controls are more about developing good habits and keeping pest populations low through good habits and through the use of biologicals as a background control method. Well, do you have any other tips for upstart farmers who are looking to implement an integrated pest management strategy? Collaborate with your fellow farmers. A lot of them have experienced the same pests and had to deal with them in the same kind of system. So, yeah. I will add one final tip on for our upstart farmers who have got pest control problems, and that is make friends with your local extension agent. Uh, we get a lot of people who will send us pictures of their pest problems, and sometimes we can tell what it is, but it's nowhere near as effective as getting an extension agent in to actually look at your problem, see samples, and uh, help you out on an ongoing basis. All right, thanks, Amy, for joining us today. You're very welcome, Perry. And as always, thanks, Nate. So if there's one thing you take away from today's episode, it's that an integrated pest management strategy is crucial for any farm since it identifies the point at which it's economically feasible to control your pests and gives you several control methods on how to do so. This has been Integrated Pest Management on Upstart Farmers Radio. Check out radio.upstartfarmers.com for more information on this episode and to learn more about the Upstart Farmers.